All right, so we'll get going here. Um, so here's chapter five, resampling methods. Um, it was a pleasant surprise to find that it was a shorter chapter this, this week, so a bit of a reprieve. Uh, so what are we gonna talk about today? Um, we're gonna about, learn about two of our resampling methods, cross-validation and the bootstrap, both of which uh, refit a model to samples formed from a training set to obtain additional information about the fitted model. Um, used to provide estimates for the test set prediction error and standard deviation and bias of parameter estimates. Um, and recall that the training error rate is often quite different from the test error rate uh, and thus can dramatically underestimate it. Here's a graphic illustrating that. Um, this is known as the bias variance trade-off. We can see that the uh, training error does not give a good idea of the test error. And that, um, oops. Do you guys see the Zoom people if I move it over here? No. All right. I still, I still see the graph. You see, all right. You don't. <laughs> okay. I, I moved the zoom controls over onto the other screen. I don't know if those showed up on zoom or not either. So, okay, good. Um, they're in the way of my presenter view. So, all right. So, uh, <clears throat> we, we see the, so the bias various trade-off, um, we see we have low bias, high variance on this side for high model complexity. Uh, high bias, low variance on the lower end of model complexity. And um, and so we're trying to find that sweet spot where we get the best test error rate without overfitting. So what can we do? Um, some of the one solution suggested in the book was to have a large test set, which uh, is often impractical and not available. Uh, other me methods like the AIC, BIC uh, make mathematical adjustments to the training error rate in order to estimate the test error rate. And I guess these will be discussed later in the book, not in this chapter, but today we're gonna discuss the methods to estimate the test error rate by holding out a subset of the training data um, as a validation or holdout set and then applying the statistical learning method to these holdout observations to obtain an estimate of the test error. All right, and again, you know, some of the methods we'll go over, validation set uh, to estimate the, terror, the test error, you use also leave one out cross-validation and k-fold cross-validation, um, and then we'll get a little bit into the bootstrap and describe some advantages and disadvantages of each of these methods. Um, validation set approach involves first randomly splitting the data um, into a training set and validation set, and then fit the model on that training set. The fitted model is used then to predict the responses of the validation set and then the validation set error provides an estimate of that test error. So we can see an infographic of that here, split into our validation set and training set. And, and, and I guess I have a note here the, to correct a point of confusion I had that this is not equivalent to twofold cross-validation since uh, the validation set are technically not crossing over. We're just training on one, testing on the other, not crossing over. Um, some pros and cons of this technique. Uh, one advantage is that the validation set is that it's con conceptually simple to understand. The infographic was very simple. Um, however, the validation error rate is variable depending on the assignment of the training and validation sets. Uh, I have a see that in the next slide if I have a graphic of that. Um, we are also giving up a lot of our data to form the validation set. And so we don't have the full set to train the model on. Thus the validation error rate will tend to overestimate the actual test error rate because we have fewer observations used in this training. 
Uh, I also have here to note that certain applications, such as time series analysis, is it's not feasible to randomly split the data like this. Here's the graphic I was talking about uh, illustrating the variance in the validation error. We, this was used uh, to predict the miles per gallon from the polynomial functions of horsepower from the auto data set. Uh, we see on the left here that this is the error estimates for a single split into the training and validation sets. Um, and then on the on the right, we have the validation method repeated 10 times, each using a different validation set um, and, and training set. So we can see that the variability in this um, estimated mean square error, th there is large variability that results from this approach. Um, we can also see that the quadratic model um, in all of these cases leads in, seems to be the best model. Um, and uh, and but with more splits, there's depending on a lot more variability. And in the in the in the video lectures, Rob noted that there's two things we wanted to use validation for. First one was pick up the pick the best size of the model, i.e. the the degree of polynomial to be best. And then the second is to get an idea of actual test error. We noted that validation is good at this first, but bad at, or not so good at the second. Now we're moving on to cross-validation and starting with leave one out cross-validation. And this aims to address some of the setbacks, drawbacks of the validation set approach. It involves splitting the data into training and validation sets similar to the validation set approach. Um, however, in this case, the validation set includes only a single observation, and the training set includes all of the other n minus one observations. Uh, here's a illustration of that. We can see that the single validation um, observation is in this orange color. The remaining training data in blue. And so we have a very large training set since we're not splitting into two roughly equal data sets. Um, therefore, the mean square error provides a relatively unbiased estimate of the test error. But since it is based only on a single observation, it's, it's, very, it's highly variable and not a great estimate on its own. Um, however, if we repeat this process over all observations such that we're building in models and estimating, the test error in times when we average all these estimates over the models, we do get a fairly good estimate of the test error. Some advantages to leave one out, cross-validation over the validation set approach. One, it has lower bias since models are repeatedly fitted on a, a single, um, on slightly different data sets. Uh, therefore, it tends to not overestimate the test error rate as much as the validation set approach does. Um, and performing Lee one out validation multiple times will always yield the same results. Uh, there's no randomness in the training. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm going to come back to this point in a little bit because I do have a question on it, but I will wait till we get to the bias various trade off to bring that up. Some other notes for leave one out cross validation. Um, a major disadvantage is that it is computationally expensive since you're essentially running the model n times for each individual observation in that training set. Um, but it can be used for various different kinds of models, including you know linear logistic regression, LDA, QDA. Um, they noted in the book a special case, a uh, special court shortcut for leave one out cross validation that makes fitting a model, um, what did they say it was like the uh, applies to least squares and polynomial regression models that make it computationally equivalent to fitting just a single model. However, any other statistical learning method, you need to run all the computations. 
which brings us into K-full cross-validation, uh, an alternative to leave one out, which involves dividing the data set into K groups or folds of approximately equal size. Um, then the percent of the data that is in the validation set can be thought of as one over K. Uh, they, we see next an example where we split K, use five groups. So 20% of the data would be withheld for testing. Um, and so in this case, leave one out is a special case of K-fold cross-validation where K is just equal to N. Um, and then we'll see the test error is estimated by averaging the five resulting mean squared error estimates. Here's the illustration of K fold. In this case, K equals five. We see five different folds in each fold, a different set is held out for the validation set and the remaining is our training set. <clears throat> and, and a note that it was randomly split into the five non overlapping. Um, Here's another uh, graphic they had in the book. Cross validation was used on the auto data set to estimate um, the test error. Again, predicting miles per gallon on polynomial functions of horsepower. On the left, we have the leave one out cross validation. On the right, we have tenfold cross validation um, that was run nine separate times, each time on a different random split of the data. Um, and so we see that some variability in the cross-validation estimates as a result of variability in how the observations were divided, but this variability is not as significant as it was for the um, validation set approach that we saw earlier. Advantages of k fold cross-validation. Um, the main advantage is computational. We're not running the model n times, we're just running it five or 10 times, whatever our, our k is. Um, but there are also other advantages related to the bias various trade-off that we'll get to shortly. Um, and so uh, they also know that cross-validation, both k-fold and leave one out, comes close to identifying the correct flexibility um, corresponding to the smallest mean square error, despite sometimes overestimating the true mean squared error. Um, here's a illustration of that. Uh, this the the data were taken from chapter two. Um, we're applying smoothing splines to the simulated data sets, um, and since the data were simulated, we can compute the true test mean square error um, and can evaluate the accuracy uh, over the cross validation results. In blue, we see the true test mean square, um, and black dashed. We have our leave one out cross validation and orange is the tenfold cross validation. Um, we can see in the right panel, they're pretty pretty much identical. So the center, the two set curves um, have lower degree of flexibility, but uh, still pretty good agreeance. Um, on the far left here, the cross validation curves have the correct general shape but they underestimate the true mean squared error. Um, however, all of them come close to identifying the correct flexibility level corresponding to the smallest mean square. Error. So, you know, close to five here, these get closer to it as well. Um, and I guess in this case, I'm just taking the author's word for it that uh, this distance is less necessary than uh, getting closer to the actual mean squared error. And here's the bias various trade off. Um, the validation set approach tends to overestimate the true test error uh, since it has high bias but low variance. Conversely, leave one out cross validation has low bias since most of the or all of the observations are used to create the models. Um, but the estimates from each of the cross validation models is highly correlated, thus, their, their mean has higher variance. Um, and a better choice would be to use k-fold cross-validation with k equals to 5 or 10. 
the test error rates do not have too much bias nor too much variance. Um, and this has been empirically demonstrated. Um, and at, at this point, I kind of want to stop pretending like I know what I'm talking about and ask a point of confusion uh, that I had. Uh, so related to this part, um, here they say, you know, the, the variance is higher because the they're highly correlated. Um, going back to this previous slide, You know, they, they say that leave one out will always yield, you know, doing it multiple times will always yield the same results um, since there is no randomness in the training validation set. Uh, and so I guess, you know, my confusion was like, if it's always leading the, yielding the same results, where's the high variance coming from? Is that high variance just because, I guess, as they say, they're each of the, folds in the k equals n folds is highly correlated since it's essentially the same data set, just one sample difference. Well, I think the, the issue with leave one out is that say you, you, you have a hundred data points, you train a model on 99 of those and test it against one. And then you do that, you know, a thousand times with different holdout observation. The models that you that you train on the on the training data are almost always trained on the same data, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's very little variation in the data, in the training data that gets fed into the model. So I think that's why. I thought I thought you said that. That's why that that that, that leave one out was highly correlated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they said it both in both parts of the book, but I guess I just wasn't. It seemed kind of contradictory. Yeah, yeah. my guess is that computationally, because uh, uh, the group has different has been splitted into different groups, but these groups, their data are highly correlated. So it means that the data, uh, uh, the the comparison between these two two groups have a high covariance. And if you want to compute the, the variance, you have to count into the covariance of these two groups. So totally, they will get a high variance in this total data set. That's my guess, computationally. OK. So like with this, like on this illustration here, like would there really be a degree of variance that we're, we're not really seeing here due to those correlated uh, validation sets. But these were just getting the point estimate, not seeing the variation, I guess. Yeah, I think there's not much, in leave one out, there's not much variance in the training data because it's always 99 out of 100. Yeah. And the one is different, but the 99 is more or less the same because there's more N there. Whereas in K-fold, you're grabbing a different percentage or a different subgroup each for each fold. So those are or less correlated. Okay, yeah. Um, I have a terminology question here. So, yes. So uh, whenever the test error rate is discussed in the chapter, it's talking about either validation set or the leave one out or the cross validation method. But don't we also have a test set that we just split out at the very beginning once uh, we get the data? And that's the real test set that the model mm -hmm. doesn't see uh, even during cross validation. So that's something that's tested at the very end. So I consider that that is the test error uh, that we estimate at the very end. Uh, but I think it's confusing that even for validation set, they use the term test error rate. Yeah, well, we're we're estimating the test error rate with the cross validation. I think, you know, for some of these, since like for instance, this it's simulated data, so we know the true, we know what the true test error is. 
And so we're they're they're indicating the how close the cross validation is getting to that true test error. But yeah, I, technically we should be referring to the validation set error rate and then the test error would be the, on the error rate on that true test set. Yeah, and I think there's there's also just a lot, a lot of if you if you read six books on machine learning, you you will see five different ways of describing the same thing. Hmm. Like test versus validation versus holdout. Like a lot of it means the same thing, but they just use different terminology. Yeah. Because my concern is that if we are using validation set approach, for example, and uh, later this will be used to uh, tune hyperparameters of the model. So the model does have some information about the validation set uh, that could be in the form of leave one out or it could be in the form of the test set part of cross validation. So all of that is something that the, mod, uh, the model has information about. And we don't really want our real test set to be touched by the model at all. We only want to test it at the real end. So yeah, I think that the terminology confuses me <laughs> that I, are we discussing the test data here or are we discussing only the validation part? But I understand that it's all discussion on the validation set. Yeah, there's yeah. actually, um, so this is, I found this book is more about the theory, mm -hmm. it's not as helpful with um, working with re real world practice. Um, the Tidy Models book has a couple chapters on on this. Um, I'll, I'll put links in the chat. Uh, he breaks it down, um, I think, in a more understandable way for just everyday work. Mm -hmm. Like you got train tests. Sometimes you have train test and validation. The way he he talks about cross validation is you do train and test split basically 80 20. And then you then you then you take the, the that 80% of the train and cross validate with that. Mm -hmm. And then, then use the test as the true final test. Yeah. And, and I think the is about... like a different thing entirely. The Tidy Models framework makes that really easy and explicit that first thing first, you're splitting off that training and you don't touch it until you're ready to actually, or yeah, excuse me, I misspoke. You're splitting off that test set and you don't touch it until you're ready to actually test. Um, but uh, but but yeah, I, I, I had similar thoughts, especially when I'm coming up on this bootstrap part where they go a lot into the theory and then the explanation using simulated data, which never will happen in the real world, then gets kind of confusing with the actual method use case in the real world. So, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, speaking of that, we'll move on. Oh. I guess cross validation um, versus for classification first before moving on to bootstrap um, can also use it for for for, uh, for classification problems uh, qualitative why rather than the quantitative why we've been discussing the cross validation works the same as described except we're using the number of misclassified observations instead of mean squared error to quantify the error um, and therefore leave one out error rate takes this form that we see down here where we're actually we're essentially summing the or averaging the misclassified error rate rather than mean squared error rate. And here's an example of that again, again with simulated data up here um, where we know the, the Bayes decision boundary in, in purple and trying to uh, predict the with the the polynomial logistic regression model on the 
on the data to get a sense of the test error rates. Um, the, the error rates for the four different panels are depicted here. Um, and we get the true, we know the true Bayes error rate of 0 0.133. Um, so we can see the, I guess the third degree uh, polynomial here is actually the best, um, best fitting. Um, but as we kind of discussed in real life, we don't know the true test error rate. Um, and we need to estimate this test error rate. Uh, and so that can be done with the K-fold cross-validation, which is a good estimate of the true test error rate. Um, again, example depicted here, one for, uh, <clears throat> what was this, logistic regression, and then this one's for K-nearest neighbors. Um, so two different methods. Test error rate is in brown. Um, so again, that's the value that typically is unknown, which we're trying to estimate with our cross-validation in black. And in blue, we see that these are the training error rates. Um, as noted earlier, the training error rate often, um, you know, one, it decreases as the complexity increases and can lead to overfitting. Um, and so we're trying to get that sweet spot of the true error rate um, that we're not overfitting on. And we see that the tenfold cross-validation gives a pretty decent estimate of this error rate, um, even though it slightly underestimates this error rate compared to the true error rate. It takes a, gives a pretty good estimation of the minimum um, value of K that can be used in order to get the error rate. And so now moving on to the bootstrap. Uh, so the bootstrap involves generating distinct data sets by repeatedly sampling in observations from the data set to attain an estimate of the statistic in question. Um, can be used in a wide variety of modeling frameworks to estimate uncertainty associated with an estimator, be that either the standard errors of a coefficient or confidence intervals around that coefficient. Uh, and again, the sampling is performed with replacement. Here's kind of a depiction of that. Um, we can see that each observation can appear either more than, more than once or not at all in each of the resulting uh, sampling, resampling sets. So we can see the observation three was repeated twice in this first one, um, two was not at all. Here we get one of each, and then again, two repeated twice in this third one, one not at all. And then taking many bootstrap samples, over and over again can be used to compute the standard error of the bootstrap estimates. And this standard error serves as an estimate to the standard error of the statistic, which was estimated from the original data set. And here's an illustration of that. Um, again, in the book, they go through a whole example of simulating um, this real, uh, a simulation of the data set where they can go through and actually resample, take a sample from the entire population over and over again, um, and then comparing that to the bootstrap method uh, where we're resampling from our resampling from our single sample, um, which would be a more of a real life use case. Um, comparing the two methods, in this case, what the example is. Um, talking about the investment of two assets, X and Y, um, and we're trying to estimate the fraction of the investment they call alpha, which minimizes our total risk or total variance of the investment. And so comparing the bootstrap distribution in blue to the sampling distribution of the estimator in orange, we see that two distributions look very similar. 
um, with comparable estimates of alpha and similar standard error estimates. Um, yeah, and 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 so we can see that the uh, the bootstrap does get a you know pretty good estimation. Um, another question I had here that I wanted to pose to the group is, you know, so they went through this whole example of doing this uh, distribution of the estimator, but that 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 all of that section wasn't technically a true bootstrap, right? The bootstrap has to be resampled from just a single population. Is that my understanding correct on that? I think the right bootstrap is useful is that because we don't know the underlying distribution of the true red population. So we have yeah, we to resample. Really. Yes, we have to sample multiple times of the samples that we already have. And it's like the resampling within the data set. And then we resample each, uh, a thousand times. So we kind of uh, put into the large, large number. Uh, large number hypothesis so that we can we can have a results have a statistics that's 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 that is uh, uh, similar to the true distribution to the underlying distribution that's my understanding of the bootstrap yeah 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 so, so the difference between so i guess a couple of differences that, that i'm thinking through between the bootstrap and cross validation is that with Cross validation, there is a holdout set in each fold, whereas bootstrap, there's no hold holdout. You're just sampling or resampling, and then within the bootstrap, each training set, or sorry, within cross validation, that each training set is sampled without replacement, whereas the bootstrap samples with replacement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the same, the same. Observation can, can exist in the training set of each fold, but it only exists once in each fold. Yeah. Whereas in the bootstrap, you could sample it, you know, as many times as as the seed says so. Yeah, and it can exist in many different folds, I guess, of the bootstrap. Yeah. So, so it means that uh, because the bootstrap, we can sample it with replacement. So if we have a data set that has only a hundred observations, but we can we can resample it with a thousand samples, right? Because it's with replacement, we can sample it in uh, 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 we can sample it one time with a thousand bootstrap samples. So I, I don't know if that's viable in the practical situation because uh, the, the bootstrap samples are larger than the observations, but it's, but we can do that. But I don't know if that's helpful for us to generate the results that is useful. Yeah, and I'm assuming the, the bootstrap estimates are only as good as your original sample is at uh, actually identifying the, the population. Right, if the sample is not representative of the total population, then the bootstrap is going to be limited by that. Yeah. I think. And um, let's see what else I have left. I don't know, that might have been the last slide. Yep. So. Yeah, that was, that was all I have for today, a short chapter. Um, so did anybody else have anything to discuss? Or if not, we could probably leave it here. Yeah, I found that you... question. Yeah, I found that question about the L, uh, leave one out, why, why it has a high variance. And I found that there's a lot of discuss online. So I posted the link in the in the Slack channel. And, uh, and I think uh, it will give us an overall introduction about the problem. So maybe you guys can have okay. it out there. Excellent, thank you. Um, and also, I don't, I don't know if you all saw my 
Slack message from uh, from last week. I will likely be missing next week, so I'm going to have to break the cycle of the same presenter presenting chapter and um, and lab. So if anybody wants to step up and present the the lab information for next week, uh, that would be appreciated since I likely will be late or be have to miss it completely. No problem, thank you very much.